Welcome uh, to our talk about the Redec uh, and its integration with the radar. Uh, so, uh, my name is Marek Milkovic and together with me is uh, Petr Matula. We work at Avast, uh, where we work at uh, where we work on Red Deck. Uh, also, honorable mention, Peter Kubov. He unfortunately couldn't make it here, but he did a huge amount of work uh, regarding the R2 integration. So we really gotta mention him. Uh, so today we are gonna talk about the Red Deck. Uh, Basically, the goal uh, for us uh, is to become like the viable option for the compilation. Like you have a R2 deck. Uh, this morning we found out that we also have a Ghidra, uh, but we would like to become like another option uh, for the users to use some kind of the compilation tool. Uh, we would uh, also like to hear some kind of feedback from you. Because uh, personally, we didn't know much about Radar before we started working on this integration. Uh, so uh, we would really like to hear the feedback from the users of the Radar, but also from the developers, like are we going in the right direction with the whole integration process. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this talk uh, is going to be about Red Deck. I'll first uh, introduce what is Red Deck, how does it work, and then Peter will talk about uh, the integration uh, and the future. So uh, Red Deck uh, stands for uh, Retargetable Decompiler. Uh, it kind of resembles uh, Radar uh, in a way that it's not like the one monolithic tool, it's more like a set of tools that when you use them in a right order, uh, you build some kind of pipeline with them, you get the decompiler. But there are many libraries, tools you can use as a standalone for your own good. Uh, like, uh, I'll mention some uh, on our way. Uh, we are based on uh, LLVM. Uh, and we support like many uh, architectures. You can see them uh, on the on the slides. Uh, there are some links. The most active one is probably the GitHub, uh, but you could also follow us on Twitter if you want. Uh, basic structure of uh, Red Deck: uh, we take the binary file uh, on the input. We do some kind of pre-processing with it. I'll mention uh, later what is going on in the pre-processing phase. And we get something what we call image. Uh, image is like a binary uh, that is loaded to the some kind of virtual address space. Something like if you start the radar uh, without the dash and uh, flag, like you get uh, the memory regions mapped to some kind of uh, segments. Uh, we work with this in a core. Uh, the core of the decompiler, actually, that's where all the LLVM magic happens. And uh, the output of the core is LLVM IR code. Uh, the LLVM IR code is then processed in a backend, and uh, we then generate the C from the backend. Uh, so uh, here's the pre-processing uh, stage of the decompiler. Uh, we take the binary and the first thing we want to do is we want to abstract away what kind of file is that. We support uh, PEs, ELFs, MACOs, but we don't want to deal with it uh, during the decompilation. So uh, we have this file format library uh, which is able to like parse out the binary file into some kind of uniform representation. Like, you know, in uh, P files, you have uh, import address tables and import lookup tables. Uh, for L files, you have just a symbol table. And if you want to recognize which symbols are imported, you want to do it uh, using their flags. But you know that both of them are imports, so you want to get them to some kind of uniform uh, representation. And that's what this uh, file format library uh, does. 
Uh, we also do compiler and packer detection using uh, a lot of Yara signatures. We also provide you a way to generate your own uh, signatures if you uh, lack some kind like a compiler or packer in our own database. And uh, the output of uh, this is a JSON file, which contains all the information that were parsed out. Uh, what do we also do, like a sidetrack uh, to this, is uh, unpacking. Uh, because uh, mostly uh, when we want to decompile something, we don't want to decompile the packed binary. So we are trying to run a series of unpackers. Uh, here is just the UPEX is uh, this shown here, but we there are many more unpackers we run and we uh, try to do it uh, recursively uh, until we get to the some kind of binary that we no longer can unpack, and that is what we consider like our input file to the rest of the the compiler. Uh, uh, the core of the, the compiler uh, then takes the JSON uh, that was generated by the preprocessing phase, and it also takes something, uh, the image, like I mentioned what is image, uh, but it also has some additional uh, inputs, like uh, it can take debug information and make use of it uh, during the decompilation and also description of ABIs, so we can know like how we want to deal with the, the instructions. Uh, then there is this big uh, black box or big dragon uh, that does the magic, and the output is uh, the LVM uh, code. Uh, what actually happens in that big black, big black box is we do some kind of initialization uh, first, and then we want to start decoding the instructions. But uh, we don't want to decode every single instruction, so what we do is we uh, remove statically linked code. Uh, this helps us to uh, actually decompile less things because you don't care uh, about a decompiled printf uh, function if it's statically linked. Uh, but it also helps us in a call side. Uh, if you have a call uh, to this function and we know that uh, it refers to a statically linked function, then we can basically start inferring the arguments of the function uh, from this fact. Uh, so we do a recursive traversal, uh, traversal uh, and we decode instructions. Uh, then we start doing some low-level passes uh, on what we have decoded, like stack analysis, global function analysis, where are the boundaries of the functions. Uh, and at this point, we also generate the disassembler. Uh, then we start uh, transforming the instructions to the LVM. We want to get this, uh, like uh, how we uh, abstracted away the input file format, we want to abstract away now the instruction format. So we want to get this LVM for every single architecture. Uh, and uh, as we get these LVM uh, instructions, we do some passes over the LVM code and we get like optimized LVM. Uh, if you have never seen the LVM code, uh, it looks like this. It's like uh, it's low level. It's like architecture independent assembler, uh, but it contains a few abstractions you probably don't uh, necessarily meet in assembly languages like functions or global variables uh, and types. But it still doesn't contain the high-level uh, constructs like conditions or uh, loops. You still have uh, conditional, unconditional branches, so you can't really take the LVM and start generating the output code uh, right away. You need to do some processing. You need to find these high-level uh, constructs. Uh, that's why we have a backend. Uh, the backend takes the LLVM, 
and converts it to uh, we call it beer. Uh, it's like a backend IR. Uh, it's just an abstract syntax tree, uh, and we do some kind of optimizations over it, uh, and then uh, from the optimized uh, BIR. Uh, we call the output gen, which uh, generates the code, uh, C code. Uh, this is just the representation of uh, the abstract syntax tree. And on the right hand side, you can see like what we are trying to find in these uh, trees. Like uh, in the upper uh, left corner, you can see if else. Uh, in the upper right corner, you can see some if, else, if, else, if. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, you can see some loop that contains the break inside. So we are trying to locate these things and basically construct these high level constructs uh, from the LVM code, which doesn't contain them. Uh, that would be it, and I'll hand over uh, word to uh, Peter. So, hi. Uh, I will start with IDA plugin, just to give you an idea uh, where we started and what we already have. This plugin has been up for, I don't know, a few years probably, and you can see that it's, it looks pretty much native to, to IDA. It tries to look like uh, hex rays. You can decompile some functions selectively, and then just, for example, double click on some other function and it, it will get the compiled jump back and front. It is not on this, uh, this video, but if you right click on something, you have uh, actions that you would expect, like a rename or something like that. You can change types and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so the other very important thing is that we are exporting information from IDA so, and then using them. So for example, if you rename function in IDA or it has some specific name, we are trying to use that name. We are trying to use those types and everything that you can set in IDA. Uh, because we want our output to look just the same as you see in the disassembly. How do we do that? Uh, like you would expect, there is some binary on the input, you load it in IDA, and there is a, uh, uh, there is a Red Deck plugin in there. And when you trigger it, it will just extract all the information in JSON, which we call like config. And this config together with the binary is then passed to Red Deck. Red Deck decompiles it. In the process, it uses the JSON information. So for example, if it would like normally assign some name to a function, it won't do that, but it will try to, uh, try the, uh, try to find the name in JSON and use that one. Uh, it produces C. This C is like standard plain text C. What you need to show uh, syntax highlighted code in uh, hex race or in IDA, uh, you need to put some specific flags there so that uh, it is pretty, there are pretty colors. We do this uh, by using pigments uh, Python syntax highlighter, which is not very nice and I will, this will play some role in, uh, in, in later. Uh, this will in include some tags and then we can show it in uh, hex race. And the plugin itself contains some UI actions that you can do. Uh, so that was uh, the starting point, and now to the uh, R2 plugin. Uh, some plugin already existed. It was in this uh, this GitHub account. We didn't do this, so this is not uh, this this uh, this GitHub account isn't us. But we started it, we forked it, and uh, started to uh, to make it better. You can see that it is already doing something. So you can uh, install it. We are. Uh, R2 uh, packet manager, and you can already decompile some functions or whatever. So, uh, how does it look in like bigger picture? Pretty much the same as uh, the plugin for IDA. Um, one thing, there is no some uh, custom script that I would have to write for syntax highlighting. We just take the C uh, and use some uh, JS. Uh, library to synthesize highlight it and display to the user. Yeah, the plugin is in, uh, in JavaScript, at least for now. So we take this and started to do some modifications. 
what I'm going to present next isn't uh, based on this uh, original repository, but on this fork. Uh, and also the changes necessary in Redec are not in master yet. They are in uh, branches that are called R2Con. Uh, you can reproduce it, but I wouldn't uh, <laughs> suggest it uh, as for now. This is pretty much work in progress. So uh, we will move the branch uh, or uh, the whole repository somewhere else, the plugin, and we will let you know where it is. We also will move or merge these uh, branches to master when they are ready. Um, so now for the improvements. Let's start with input files themselves. And let's start with the second picture uh, that I should probably should put first. Uh, uh, if you load the binary in IDA and you do some modifications, uh, is this a problem for a deck? In Hexrace or in IDA it is because it doesn't get uh, modi uh, like um, written back to the file and it only the, the modifications are only in IDA like representation of the file. So when you trigger the compilation, the original file gets uh, decompiled. And you've got problem because it is not the same thing that you see in IDA. You don't have this problem in uh, Radar because you are forced to open the file in write mode if you want to modify it. And it gets written back to the binary. So the binary we are working with is the, the correct one, the modified one. Uh, this asked, uh, like begs the question if we can do this uh, somehow better and like unify it and don't care or, uh, about the the original tools or how they behave. Um, I am thinking about uh, like um, writing a new input mode that everything would be in, uh, in JSON, in self-contained JSON. It has some pros and cons. I like the idea that it is self-contained and everything is in this one file that you can uh, compile. You don't even care if it is like ELF or PE or whatever. You just go got the like dump of the sections or everything uh, everything that you need. There are some problems that I can see. Like it would be probably big, and maybe we will just make ourselves a lot of work. But who knows? Uh, so this is not not implemented yet, and maybe it will never it will never be. But who knows? So now we've got the binary itself, and we want to like uh, start the compilation process. What happens in both in uh, Radar and Red, uh, Redac is if you want to disassemble and compile it, you need to like disassemble it. And the disassembling itself isn't that easy. It isn't like naively written linear uh, disassembler that would just start somewhere and continue until the end of the file. It is using some pretty clever algorithms, and it is not always trivial. It is often expensive, at least in Redec. Um, and there is a potential that when we do this process twice, once in Radar and once, once in Redec, the, like the, the results will be different. So for example, those nice uh, examples that Pancake showed, when you've got like side by side uh, disassembly and uh, the compilation output, it doesn't have to match uh, uh, if you use Redec. So the solution is um, we can also extract control flow, which we uh, weren't been doing so far. Um, you basically just add new structures to JSON. The, R2 plugin will dump the control flow and the Redex decoder will just disable all the functionality that, that tracks the addresses and targets and just use, uh, use the information in JSON. Okay, um, we already saw, right, I mentioned JSON a lot of times, so we can extract all the informations or yeah, pretty much all the informations from R2 to JSON and then use them. At the moment, we do like function names, demangled names, uh, calling conventions, arguments, types, and so on. Um, there are some problems, mostly with global variables. Um, there is some open issue in R2. Um, I think for global variables, we so far have only names. It's, on, it's if I understand it correctly, because the names are just like some attributes of, of some addresses, but there is like no real concept of uh, global variables in R2, but I may be mistaken. Anyway, uh, when this will be fixed, we can also do global variables. Uh, one big thing that we work, worked uh, during the summer uh, pretty heavily on is types. This includes uh, like complex structure types. 
One tick that uh, Red Deck pretty much sucked before and still sucks in Master is like um, complex types. So for example, if you start with this C, there is structure of three ints, and then you work with the ints. And there is a global variable and you assign to the elements of the ints. Uh, if you decompile it with us or with probably any other tool, you get something like this. Is this because the compiler can generate like accesses right to the correct address? Uh, so there is no way to to tell that there was a structure there. So we will just see the first element is as at address, for example, 1000 hexa, 1004, 1008, so on. So yeah, we would decompile it like this. However, if you somehow provided us with the additional information and you would say that through the JSON config that on this address or there is this structure and this uh, global variable at, at this address has this type, right now we would produce something like this. We would apply the information to that address, but we wouldn't like fix all the uses of the, of the members. So uh, we know that at, at address 1000 there is this structure. We even fixed the uh, access to the first element of this address, but all the other elements are still like screwed. So uh, what we did, uh, we tried to get something like this. Um, we wrote some new uh, like aggregating algorithm that every time you are changing the type of pretty much any object during the decompilation, it will check all the other objects there and if some of the objects it is checking like belong to the to the main object, it will get transformed, uh, it will get removed, and uh, the operations uh, are on the main object. Um, this is not trivial, especially because there could be like a lot of stuff with alignment. So you can write something like there is a, a character a char and an int, and you would expect like one and five, but it may not be can be like aligned different architectures and stuff uh, stuff like this. This is pretty uh, simple example, but it should work with like arbitrary uh, complex structures and arrays when it is done and <laughs> implemented correctly without bugs. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, this, this is example with a global variable, but pretty much the same thing you can apply to local variables, even like arguments and this is uh, passing by value but also if passed by pointer. So in this case instead of addresses you work with offsets but it's pretty much the same thing. So this is the goal. Okay now another big thing uh, so far in master uh, when you get all the way to the end of the decompilation process uh, Red Deck has no information, no idea about addresses associated with statements that is uh, generated. And that means that, again, the fancy stuff that you saw in the morning, like saying this uh, assembly instruction is associated with this statement in, in C or even like sub parts of the statements is not possible in master. Why? Because somewhere around here, uh, this assembler generator, we throw out all the information about addresses. This is like historical. Hmm. We started like this many years ago and never actually added the functionality. The code grew larger and more complex and now it is not so easy to, to edit. Well, the problem is that we don't have the information. The solution is don't throw it out. But in fact, it is not so easy. Uh, first, how do we keep the information? Uh, we use something called uh, metadata in LLVM IR, and you can add metadata to most or maybe all LLVM objects. In this case, we are adding them to the instruction themselves. So here you can see a load instruction, and the red part is edit metadata of some kind. This is uh, SM other kind, but it doesn't matter the name. And index zero, and index zero says that it is the value of 64 bit integer of some value. So if I had many instructions, I would add metadata like this to, to all instructions. It looks okay and simple so far, but let's go back and let's see what like after this step. There are LLVM passes and some other custom passes. 
LLVM passes are those passes that we borrow from LLVM, and if you use Clang for compilation of something, those are the same passes that Clang would use. The problem is these passes don't know and don't care about our metadata. So they can throw it out, they can do whatever, and it is not guaranteed that uh, this information is gonna get propagated and, and preserved. So we had to hack LLVM a little bit, which we don't want to do very often, uh, but I guess uh, no other options in this case. Uh, the hack itself right now isn't like too big, it's really like few lines, and it looks that it works most of the time or all the time, but it is not guaranteed that uh, the information doesn't get thrown out. Just so you can imagine, it doesn't mean that it will get thrown out in like all the, all the module, like everywhere. It just, it can happen that one instruction is gonna get optimized and some other pass optimizes it and it, it throws out the particular information for these single instructions, but most of the times it should be okay for most of the instructions. Uh, the same problem is with our code pretty much from this point onward because all the other code after that doesn't really have or didn't have any concept of addresses. So we had to add them. Um, in backend, there are like two main objects uh, that represent the, the code, statements and expressions. So far, I added this concept of addresses only to statements. It is not yet added to expressions for some internal reasons, but it will have to be to, for this to be like really good. Uh, the issue, again, the optimization is backend. So for example, you've got this thing on the left, both of the statements have some address, it can get optimized to the, uh, to the, to the thing on the right. Now, which address should you use? I will tell you in a moment which should you use. Uh, but in general, it works at the moment, but it is, not, uh, it is not perfect and more work is needed. Uh, the other thing that we worked on is uh, third like friendly output for third parties that, that could be consumed by either Radar or uh, IDA. Uh, so far, our output was only C or Python-like code, and the problem, for example, in IDA is those, uh, those stacks for syntax highlighting that you need to insert. Now, if the plugin itself want to do this, it would have to parse the C, which is not easy. We don't want to have like C parser in plugin or in IDA or wherever. Uh, we solved it with that Python uh, highlighter, but it is not a good solution. It's simply a hack that we just put one more thing, some random Python script that takes something and uh, the C and outputs the C with some random IDA flex. Uh, the same thing is these addresses that I was talking about. Uh, you really don't have any good way to propagate this information in C. You don't want to put a comment uh, after every line and stuff like that. So we need something better. And we decided to use JSON and to serialize uh, the output to JSON. And we dropped the Python output because it simply wasn't that much used and or tested and it made uh, it harder to move forward. Now back to the addresses, or the JSON output at first. Uh, it is basically just a stream of tokens. Uh, basically what uh, Lexer would, uh, would produce when, you, when it is parsing the C code, uh, serializes in JSON. You can add custom entries to this. Uh, so far it's only addresses. Maybe in the future there will be something, something else. So when I started with addresses, I thought that all that we are going to need is like associate lines with addresses. So say this C line was on this address. Uh, the problem is like here on this example, uh, it is more complicated than that. The single line can be associated with many, many addresses because it is like high level ex uh, representations of representation of many assembly instructions. So to write something like this is assembly, this one function call, it would be maybe like 20 assembly instructions. So you don't really want to associate it with only one instruction, with one address, and just associating it with the lines is just not good enough. Uh, if you have something like this in a hex race and you uh, tap uh, space, it can jump or associate based on the position in this line with the correct address. The same thing we saw this morning in a, 
in uh, R2 with I don't know what is Gidra or uh, Gidra plugin or R2 deck I don't know but uh, this is like pretty common functionality so um, what do we do is the address is just a modifier of tokens that are following it and basically all the tokens after the address have this address and then the next address comes and it modifies all the other tokens uh, example is like this um, I guess not nothing to really log into but okay uh, the description is in, on our wiki page uh, of the, on github and I will show you some uh, some demo if it works I hopefully it will so at first um, Mm -hmm. So we are going to work with this binary, uh, binary input. We load it in uh, R2, and go to main, and now we trigger the compilation on main uh, with R2 Red Deck plugin, the one, the hours from our fork, not the one from the original repository. Okay, we already see that there is some decompilation, uh, some output. Uh, we see that the main function is called main, but other functions have no name, so this was probably stripped. The main function is calling sc uh, scanf and then calling some other function in a while loop. So what is this other function? We can go there to the other function. Maybe. We decompile it again, and we don't see much. There is, it is calling itself, there is printf, some string, but it doesn't look very useful. So we are going to expect the assembly code. And what we see here is that uh, at the start of the function, uh, it is storing some registers that were not filled in this function before, which would suggest that these registers came as arguments. Uh, this is, I think, x, yeah, it is x86. It would probably, in like default uh, con calling convention, wouldn't behave like this. So let's look into that. We are going to ask R2 what calling convention was used for this function. Okay, this is like, there was some lack, but it says that uh, C decal was used and we are going to inspect this some more and basically just by our knowledge of like these things work uh, we are going to say that uh, EC, ECX and EDS, uh, EDX is stored this is typical for fast call so we will say to R2 to uh, apply fast call calling convention to this uh, function now uh, we decompile it again and it should get uh, propagated to Red Deck. Uh, so the function looks different than it, it looked before. Before, I didn't say it, but there were no arguments. Now there are two function arguments. Uh, it was calling itself, it is still calling itself, but with those arguments. And there, there is some if, yeah, so. But it already applied stuff that it uh, took from R2. Okay, let's continue. Let's go to main and see how the function is, uh, is used. Uh, again, if we decompiled before, there was nothing, uh, no arguments. Now there are, there, there are arguments and we can see that the first argument is uh, some string and the second one is a value. Uh, the string is called factorial, okay. Then maybe the function is calling factorial. There is really like no reason why it should uh, propagate it, its name as a first argument, but it does for this, for this purpose. <laughs> Um, so what we do, we go back to function, mm. we compile it for some reason again, uh, but now we will, I hope, uh, apply some renaming. 
we renamed function to factorial. Now it's called factorial, right? And we also saw that the first argument was uh, not in 32, uh, but uh, basically string, a pointer to. So we apply, we say uh, to R2 to apply this function signature to the function. If you decompile it now, it is applied. We can see the type changed. There are no ugly uh, type of conversions that there were before. And we even see that the result of the factorial is like, uh, it is stored to variable named result and returned. This was there also not, not before. If you are asking why th this code wasn't there before, because Redeg is doing some like hmm, heavy optimization. So if something is not used, it will probably get thrown out. We just said that this variable is returned, so it gets used, or not. We said that this function is returning something that gets translated to, uh, we know what object is returned, and uh, we will return it, it gets used, and uh, we see more code than before. What else can we do? Oh yeah, we can check if it is factorial, I think. So we will run it. put in some values. It doesn't look like it. If you noticed, uh, there is no multiplication going on. There, for whatever reason, there is minus, where you would expect multiplication for uh, factorial. Um, yeah, because we didn't, yeah. We closed the R2, so we, <laughs> we need to apply everything again. Um, this is basically where we ended before. And what we can do now is uh, modify the, the instructions in uh, R2, uh, the ones that are doing sub uh, subtraction, we will modify them to multiplication. This binary was just uh, intentionally screwed up, uh, just to demonstrate it. Um, yeah, it needs to be open in the right mode. So now we are rewriting instructions in R2. Okay, I, I think this is the end, uh, or is it? Whatever. Uh, I think we saw enough. Um, or no? Oh, yeah, there was some mistake. Yeah, great. <laughs> nice. There is multiplication, and the function looks like really nice. And I guess the the goal was to show you that whatever you do in R2, uh, we can apply or try to apply in, uh, in the decompilation uh, output. Some more, um, some more. Yeah, this is, uh, I will not sh so show this in uh, radar, but I will show it in uh, just in the compilation itself. Uh, this binary has uh, dwarf inf oh has debugging information. So there are some dwarf sections here. If I decompile it like, um, like this, this is the old branch. So when decompiling through our decompilation script binary named structs, uh, I just did it. I, at, at first I will show you uh, the original input. This is called dot. So there is some vector it is just three, uh, three integers uh, filled with random values and then some uh, arithmetics going on. So this is, the, this is the original C that got compiled. I just decompiled it with basically the master or the, the branch that doesn't have the functionality. And this is the result. Like I said, we know about the types from debugging information. We apply the type somewhere, hopefully, maybe not first. Yeah. This is the global variable that got the type. 
and then the first element is uh, like filled as you would expect but the rest is pretty ugly if I do the same thing with the better branch hopefully this is the new output after the aggregation that I was talking about so this is the goal also from R2 so you as a user can uh, apply structures in R2 and then uh, it gets propagated the same as we would read it from uh, debugging information and apply to the to the output. So that's all for the demonstration. And now, now, present, yeah. Uh, now for the future, um, this is still work in progress and basically uh, today and yesterday i saw so many things that <laughs> we need to uh, make better because be before we uh, want you to use it um, so we will extract more information from r2 and basically like comments and stuff like that uh, then i saw these uh, great features of uh, uh, the cutter so we definitely want uh, our own plugin I was kind of afraid of writing this because I don't like writing uh, like uh, graphic graphic interfaces, but uh, I'm hoping to use the Ghidra plugin and pretty much just switch it for a deck. Um, and also the, the user experience writing R2 should be much better, so you should be able to use all those fancy stuff that Mankey was showing and side by side, uh, side by side disassembly and the compilation output and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I think it's on the right track. So for like like mid-term future, uh, we should like uh, answer some questions, like how much we should like apply blindly everything that comes from R2, or do we want to uh, redact to use some of its own analysis? Uh, if there is some more information that the redact finds out. Do we want to propagate it back to R2 and stuff like this? All this could be configurable, but it is not at the moment. It would make this whole thing uh, more complicated, but it would give you as a user more, more power. Because as you saw right now, it will just, it doesn't ask you anything. It, will, it just decompiles, uh, uh, it just decompiles whatever you trigger it on. And there are some other stuff, as Marek said, in the Redec uh, framework, but there is also uh, much more stuff in R2, so maybe there are some other tools that uh, you as uh, users would want to, and we could use, uh, you, we could like write in the separate plugins or uh, put it into a Redact plugin, but who knows. So for like pretty long distance future, um, I guess I would like everything to be in libraries that you could use. Right now, as we saw, uh, we are triggering a Python script when you uh, trigger the compilation, it will basically just run the Red Egg as a Python script. Uh, it would be much better if Red Egg itself was a library that you could use from your tools. So for example, from uh, R2 plugin and uh, everything, everything else basically in Red Egg that would be a binary and uh, you could just use it through APIs. So this is like a big goal. And again, I think we can inspire ourselves in like, uh, how R2 does it. Uh, I saw some cool uh, cool trainings yesterday and uh, I think there is, uh, I will have to, to check it out more. So thank you, that's all from me, um, from us. Yeah, any questions? Questions? Oh, just a simple question. How do you do the, uh, um, the compiler detection? When you were saying so in the, in the, the compiled code, GCC version 4.7, are you using Jara? Are you using strings? Are you using uh, we some are heuristics? Trying, yeah, we are uh, trying to use some heuristics and uh, read the node section of the ELF binaries. There is a version written, but even if you delete it, we have uh, signatures uh, that are matched against the entry point and uh, bytes around it. Uh, and 
we basically spend some time generating signatures for various versions of uh, GCC and other compilers like MSVC, etc. So how confident are you that this is the right compiler? I mean, like, are you uh, testing well, or? basically, uh, we are probably not uh, confident to the minor version. Uh, but we are confident to the uh, major versions because uh, the entry point stub doesn't change that much around uh, uh, minor versions. Okay. Well, lovely. I want to see that later. Thank you. Okay. There's another question here. Um, hi. Uh, I would like to know how's the compatibility between the OSs with uh, your tool? So with uh, not just your tool, but also with uh, the plugin with uh, for R2. And, uh, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, um, how compatible across OSs is uh, your uh, plugin for R2 to use R2, uh, Red Deck? Okay. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I I, uh, I tested it only on Linux. So I basically tested it only on Linux. Um, the goal should be that all the three OSs, the three main OSs, should be supported. But I don't really know if it's the case now. It definitely will be once uh, we merge everything to master because uh, other Red Deck parts, all of them are running on all three OSs. Um, so yeah, that, that is going to be the goal. I think it should work. I don't really, I can't say it does, but I think it should because it's uh, the plugin itself is uh, is uh, JavaScript and you can install Red Deck on all three uh, all three systems, but I don't know. Uh, the, the IDA is on uh, on Windows and uh, Linux. It is not on Mac because we don't have Mac IDA licenses. <laughs> so um, when you pass the uh, binary and the information to uh, from R2 to uh, Redtech, so right now you use uh, the original binary, just the file that R2 loaded, right? Yes. Okay. Um, do you think it would be possible when you did all the uh, the library slide that you showed um, to make uh, Red Deck a library that you can uh, actually use all the mappings and everything from R2? So I can just, for example, load some shell code at a ram random location and then uh, decompile that. Um, okay, I don't know much about it, so maybe we we to, uh, should talk later. Yeah. I think, so. uh, I think there is uh, maybe what I was talking about, Jason. If we can all serialize this, in, all of this serialize this somehow represented in JSON and just throw the binary out, so you wouldn't need it. So yeah, you could basically just export everything that you want. So, so yeah, I guess it could be done. It is not at the moment. So um, for for Ghidra, we have just uh, one single class, which is also I think it's called load image. And we just implemented that, and it has one method, read uh, memory at some, some address, and we just uh, read the memory, and we just use R2 to do that. Yeah. So I think a solution like that would be ideal, so you don't have to. Yeah, so basically, okay, we will discuss it if it is similar to what yeah. I had in mind, but when you said this in the morning, that how you do it, I, I, said, I immediately thought that this is something that we should look into and probably, probably use this concept. Yeah, I think we should we should talk. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, well, mainly just a suggestion. Uh, I've been testing like different, like uh, well, all of the compilers that are supporting R2. Uh, I recorded a video like I was decompiling using uh, Ghidra, R2 Deck, Red Deck, uh, and, uh, the internal compiler R2, and so on. And I, it was pretty cool because you can basically have all of the compilations at the same time, so you can basically compare the results from one to the other one. So I think that having multiple the compiler support in R2 will help all of the compilers to improve. Mm -hmm. And I guess that, I mean, there is some support for um, diffing, uh, for example, in the Afra, that you can use the, the output from the compiler for diffing and fi finding out uh, which are the similar functions in different binaries and things like that. And I think that will be pretty interesting to have some kind of uh, tool that is basically comparing the output from different the compilers in order to identify and automate the issues that you can uh, probably uh, have in Red Deck. And if it's fixed in another compiler, then uh, use it as a template or maybe just mm. the compiler, the single function using 10 different the compilers and then take the, the one that is best for for it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, but I think that it's pretty uh, important to have a, a good test suite for 
not introducing like your regressions and so on. Uh, I don't know if you have like a test suite for uh, Red Deck. Yeah, there are multiple uh, layers of tests. And even on the page that I showed here, uh, these are what we call regression tests. And if you div this with the master, you can see the tests that were written just for the uh, for the R2 plugin. So basically what happens is these tests are running R2, triggering the decompilation and then checking out the output. Um, cool. But there are more tests. Mm, we try to test everything um, using uh, like Google unit tests as much as possible. Yeah. One of the problems that I found while uh, improving the integration of a Red Deck into R2 is that the output of the compiler was pr basically printing to standard output or using end courses like UI to, to mm -hmm. visualize the output. And I basically modify it to user to pipe to print that using an echo uh, into the console. I don't know if you're using that, but if you are printing the output of the compiler using the RCONS API, uh, you can basically integrate this into uh, panels mode, for example, or visual yeah. mode. Or I think the pen yeah, I made note of this when you talk in the morning. The panels no mode it looked pretty cool, and we definitely want to do that. So we will look how the other decompilers do it mm -hmm. and try to do the, the same. Sure. Yeah. We can talk later about that. More questions? Nope. Thank you. Thank you.